Hello YouTube, and welcome to a pretty scenic setting, if I do say so myself. Um, I'm in the forest right now, as you can see, and I wanted to record a video for you guys about Musashi and philosophy in particular. Now, the reason why I'm not in somewhere more uh, comfortable is because there's a lot of wind and I don't have a mic. So I hope that the trees are going to block the wind a bit and you guys can hear me properly. If the quality of the, 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 the audio is not the best, I apologize. Like it's picking up right now, so we'll see what it does. But uh, I'm pretty deep in the forest, so we should not be bothered here. There are all chipmunks jumping around around me. It's pretty cute. All right, so why did I decide to talk about this book today again? Because I have made an entire series on the Book of Five Rings and Musashi. The reason is because every single summer, ever since I was 22, so it's been a while, I read this book again. And you can see it because, well, look at the state of the book. I take it everywhere I go when I travel into the forest, especially because every time I read it again, I learn something new. And it's to the point that I really, really want to encourage you guys to give it a try as well, because it's a very short read. The book is only five bucks, and it's, in my opinion, going to change your life forever and for the better. Now, this is not going to be a long analysis, because I've already done one. This is just... Wow, okay. Sorry, I'm allergic to pollen. Something is uh, closing, my, closing up my throat right now. Let's go, let's not die on camera, please. Not die on camera. I want an honorable death like Musashi. Not be killed by a flower, that would be ridiculous. So, I'm just going to give you a quick overview, a quick summary of the things you can expect so I can tantalize you and make you want to actually open the book and read the book as well. The number one point and the first chapter of this small review is going to be Musashi himself. Because beyond his writings and his teachings, I think that what is the most interesting about him is him, it's the man. Keep in mind that Musashi never really learned how to fight. He never learned how to be a samurai like all of these other fighters who used to be nobility. They would learn the way of the sword. They would learn archery with masters. They had people who knew better. Musashi had none of that. He started when he was 13 and he started to just journey in the mountains and throughout Japan in quest for opponents. He was doing a doyo yaburi and he was just essentially looking for people to defeat. And he defeated like, I think, 60 or 70 people by the time he turned 30. And the first man he killed, he was only 13 and he killed a grown man who was trained. So how exactly did he do that? How is it possible? Well, he himself states that he could just have been a genius. I buy that. But I think it's also the fact that he was constantly training. You know, if you've read Vagabond, the manga that is based on the story of Musashi, it's fairly accurate. I mean, at some point, Musashi started to serve the Lord because he was so renowned. But his youth was just him by himself, just going through the mountains and training every single day. And this is how he defeated these masters. He says it in the book. The issue with the masters is that at some point, the master starts to teach so much that he stops to practice. And you see that also on YouTube fitness, right? You have a lot of people who end up so consumed by making videos that they stop training. And sadly, eventually, their own teachings suffer from that. Because if you don't practice, eventually, even your theory is going to be out of style. So the first lesson that the book teaches us is this, that practice comes before theory always. If you want to produce theory, that's fine, but do it once you have practiced enough to have something to offer. And also, as you produce theory, never ever actually stop practicing, because if not, your theory is going to be hors sol. It's not going to be grounded in anything. And the second thing is to walk your own way and to walk your own path. Musashi never followed the teachings of anyone, and he even states that as he was fighting, he wasn't developing any type of strategy. He started to learn the way of strategy when he was 30, once he was retired from fighting. And then when he was 50, he mastered it. So it took him more time to master theory than it did mastering practice. And that is a good lesson as well for all of you out there who lift, but you are still a bit paralyzed because you don't know everything yet. Hey, you are perfectly fine. I don't know everything either, and no one does. No one ever will, and Musashi himself admitted that by the age of 30, when he was already a great master, he knew absolutely nothing. So walk your own way. Don't be afraid. Yeah, it is going to be peril. Yes, it is dangerous, but that is why you learn. There is no peril in theory. That is why so many people love to open books. They love to read studies, because there's no risk. Nothing's going to happen to you. If you try, you might fail, but you need to be prepared to fail if you want to actually be better. And most importantly, if you want to be able to find yourself, you must be willing to walk by yourself. And when you fail and you're alone, guess what? It's on you. 
no one is going to save you. And that is so, so important. Now, I have a little quote to end this chapter directly by Musashi. Since then, I have lived without following any particular way. I practice many arts and abilities, all things with no teachers. So Musashi was his own teacher throughout his life. And there is something to be said about this age of information that we have nowadays where people like me can teach you many things about bodybuilding and we can save you a lot of time. And that is great, of course. I'm not turning my back on this, on these, all of these advancements of technology. But we also lost something. And that something is the ability to discover things by ourselves. A thing that you discover by yourself has much more value than something that someone teaches you because you have a certain degree of pride attached to that very thing. And you are very likely to stick to that thing and practice it much more than if some schmuck told you it was the best thing ever, even though deep down in your heart, you don't actually believe it. So in life, always seek to teach yourself by the help of others, not just so that you know, but so that you can become your own teacher eventually and also start teaching others. That is what we do. It's the transmission of knowledge. I teach you and one day you will teach someone else. Just like Musashi, even beyond the grave, teaches millions of men how to find themselves and how to find the path. And that path, that way that he repeats times and times again, the way in the book you will find, you will encounter that word, that term, the way. Why is it so important? Well, it's because First and foremost, the goal of every man should be to find that way and find that path. And once you have found the path, to walk it. That is what it means in Bushido to find meaning in life. It's to find the way. And I find personally that men who have their way tend to be healthier and tend to be happier in life. Those who have lost their way or worse, who have never actually found their way in the first place, have no direction and therefore they have no purpose whatsoever. But a thing that I appreciate about Musashi, and we're going to get back on it, is that he's not dogmatic. He's not telling you, hey, I found my way and my path, therefore this is the right way and you should work it as well. No, he, te he tells you, be your own teacher. And he also says, and I quote, each man practices as he feels inclined. I personally, I'm a bodybuilding channel. I think you know that at this point. Wind. But... Um, I'm not there to tell you that if you don't bodybuild, you suck. I do think that every single man and woman should be physically active. You should have physical culture in your life, but it doesn't have to be bodybuilding. It can be whatever. Each way is valid as long as it is your own way and as long as your heart is in it. So that's a very important lesson. Because if you don't actually do that work of honesty, of finding your path, what's you're going to happen is that most likely you're going to walk the path of someone else. But if you want to walk the path of the warrior, which in this case we could call the path of the lifter, the path of the man who wants to be better, the path of self-improvement, what must you do? Well, there are two imperatives regardless of the path you're going to walk. And these two are that you have to be versed in both the pen and the sword. So you have to be physical and you have to be cerebral. You cannot have one and not the other. It doesn't work like this. This is the complete man. And isn't that so interesting that a culture like Japan that is so far removed from Greece, would develop a type of philosophy that is extremely and remarkably similar to Stoicism. Bushido and Stoicism share so many aspects, like meditation on death, you have to consider yourself as dead, and also this aspect right there, the fact that you have to be complete. The idea of the complete man, the warrior who is also able to use his brains, that is the complete man. That is something that I think we should all strive towards. And this book, this entire book is focused on that notion. So why do we want to be the complete man? Well, we want to avoid being a simple sword fencer, what he called sword fencers back then, which I would translate into a midhead. A midhead is someone who just moves his body. He doesn't think, he just moves the body. You're not going to get very far if that's the only thing you do in the gym or in life in general. You have to be full of intent when you do things. But you also don't want to be a master of strategy, someone who is so versed into the theory that he has stopped practicing. I already described that. And I'm so certain that you also can relate that to the world of fitness. All of these people who I call the biomechanics gurus, who have all of this knowledge and notions about the way the body should move and what is the best lift and what if and what that. And then you look at their bodies and they don't look like they lift. What exactly is the point? It's the same with Musashi. I'm certain that Musashi must have run into all of these masters of strategy and be like, all right, take off your sword. Let's, let's have a fight. Let's see, what you, let's see what you can do, right? Stop talking. Let's see what you can do with the sword. And the, the, the masters were completely pitiful and Musashi killed them and was like, all right, well, you are no master because you can't even apply what you teach others. So instead, you must allow both of these ways, the pen and the sword, 
to transcend themselves and to become one. Because in reality, they are one. There is no separation between the mind and the body. They are, the, they are one and the same. And once these two are together, what happens is this. The true value of sword fencing, so physical activity, will reveal itself because its true value cannot be seen within the confines of sword fencing techniques. I think the same about bodybuilding. If what you think of bodybuilding is, oh, it's, it's big muscles and it's just I'm getting bigger, you're missing the point. The point is spiritual, right? We all start because we want to get bigger, we want to get girls. That's fine. It's the first step. We start at as sword fencers, just like any young boys in the age of Musashi, you give them like a kendo stick, like a wooden stick, and they would just like beat rocks with, like it's normal. You're not going to open yourself to the path at, at the start. But the more you develop the body, the more you should realize that you're not really only doing it for the body. You're also doing it to develop what is up there and what is inside as well, your heart. And once you have the ability to do that, once you have become versed in both ways, you will start to see it in everything. And I think that this is truly the point where you can now call yourself complete in the sense that you will start seeing aspects of your sport and aspects of your passion everywhere. I see bodybuilding in everything that I do. When I see people move, I can sort of tell which muscles are more developed than the others. I can look at someone who's never lifted in their life and I can sort of tell which muscles are more prone to developing faster, which are the genetic strong points, what is going to be tough to develop, all of these things everywhere, it's always around me because I'm always surrounded by the way. That is when I know that I actually walk the way. And once you reach that point that is like a, almost a form of consciousness that is expanded across you, then I think that not only can you call yourself complete, but you are also on the way. But once you're there, your journey is not over yet because now the challenge is to stay on the way because you can end up on the wrong way. Life is not so easy that there would be only one way for every single human and every single creature. And there very might be hobbies and things that I could have accomplished or followed and that you could have accomplished or followed as well that would have been just as fulfilling. You are not doing them right now, so you don't even have to worry about it. But this shows us that if there are multiple good ways, then there must also be multiple wrong ways. And one way, one look at the fitness industry around us, at anyone who, who is connected to this, is... Oh, cheap monk. All right. Is the fact that we see who on two eyes that there seems to be people who walk the wrong way. Do they walk the wrong way because they're not doing exactly what we do? No, that is not the point. The wrong way is a different thing altogether. If you walk your path, you are walking your path because this is your path of fulfillment and improvement. But if you start walking a path in quest for your own ego, in a, in a way to feel better and not to be better, then you are most likely going to end up a dogmatic stance, which is not going to do you any good. Example, all of these people out there in any path of life who look for the best way. You know these types. They will refuse to take one step if they are not certain that this path that they are going to start working on is not the right path or the correct path. What happens to these people? They never get anything done. Why? Because there is no such thing as the right path. There is no such thing as the correct path. There is only the path and there is only the way. And only those willing to walk far enough will realize eventually that, yes, it was the correct one because any path that you dedicate yourself to with love is going to be the correct one. But some people disagree with me on that and they will tell you that there is indeed a correct way. And they might even welcome you to walk the way with them. They will guide you on the path and you will be very thankful for them because you'll think, well, they're going to save me so much time and I won't even have to think. They will be thinking for, my, for, my, for me, right? They will save me so much effort. The problem is that in this lays the poison, in this lays your error. You expect someone else to take the risk for you. And do you know why these people do it? I mean, it's even Musashi back then knew why. He says it clearly. He says it's for profit. It's because there is profit in having other people follow you on the path. If you're on the path and you follow someone else's back, guess what? You're not really on the path because you are not looking at where you are going. These people, according to Musashi, are putting arts for sale and they use equipment to sell their own selves. This is also directly connected to our epoch and to what we live with, you know, as a, as a fitness community. How many times have you seen people like this who seem to run gimmicks, not because the gimmick is actually potent or because it's going to help people, but because they perceive that there is value in it for themselves. They can profit from selling it. 
which also shows that these people are very unlikely to be of any help because their number one worry when it comes to developing a technique is to make sure that the technique is marketable, it's, that it's sexy and flashy. Back then, the same problem existed. A lot of schools, uh, of salt fencing, fencing schools, developed super developed techniques that look really cool, but that didn't actually do nothing. And Musashi would actually challenge these schools and say, hey, you look pretty with your two swords, but you're not going to win a fight. And he was right times and times again, because these people do what he called putting the flower before the nut, meaning that they hastened the bloom of the flower. They were so excited with showing off the techniques that they never stopped to think whether the technique was going to be useful or not, meaning that the nut that they planted in the ground was important. It was not going to lead to a, to a pretty flower, but they did not care because in their hearts, the only thing that they truly cared about was profit. This will always be true. It will never stop being true. Humans always care about their own profit first and foremost and their selfishness. So it's up to you to not follow these people and to recognize them for what they are. Because if you follow them, guess what? You will be walking their own way. You will be walking on their path for their own benefit, which means also that your progress will end. But you are very unlikely to know that because you are going to be entering a spiral of ego where you're going to walk on the path not to be better, but to feel better. And this is when you are going to have certain types of behaviors, which are, for example, the fact that you are going to be very concerned with coloring and showing off your technique. Or you'll be the type of person who speaks of this dojo and that dojo. Does that sound familiar? How many people on YouTube Fitness are like this? When they say, oh, this guy's methods are superior. No, this guy. They never actually look at the methods because they never cared about the methods. What they care about is the attachment to their own ego. They want their camp to win. It's like a sports team to them. These people, times and times again, never walk the path. They are completely inactive. The only thing that they're interested in is feeling better because deep down, they know that they're not good. They're mediocre. But instead of developing themselves, developing their skills and walking the path, which takes effort, they engage instead in just constant dogmatic challenges. And at the end of the day, they create their own purgatories because you and I who are concerned with training and becoming better. We just walk right past these people. We don't even care what they have to say. This is that spirit that we need to keep developing. Your goal should be to make sure that you do not end up like these people. You do not want to be obsessed over the paving of the path and of the way. If the path is pretty, if the way is pretty, that does not matter. What matters is, are you walking the way? And if yes, how can you continue walking the way until the day that you die? And this is when we can start talking about this last little chapter, little summary that I hope is going to make you want to open and read the book. And that is my favorite teaching from Musashi that is very concise and simple, but also very profound. He says multiple times throughout the book that from one thing, you should be able to know 10,000 things. And to me, that is exactly the type of anti-dogmatic stance that we should try to adopt in this modern world. Dogmatism is the notion of espousing one idea and then refusing to, to budge from it, even if you receive information that contradicts that idea because you have attached your ego to the idea. It's now your it's, it's now, in a sense, your doo-doo, as we say in French, on doo-doo. It's like, it's your totem. It's something that is, is dear to your heart because you have attached so much of your own value to this idea, to this dogma. Oh, spider, come here. Come here. Look at her. Ah, she left. I love spiders. Um, you have attached so much of your own value to this dogma that, in a sense, renouncing the dogma would be renouncing yourself. You must be able to renounce yourself because... Only the path is eternal and only your own honesty towards the path will keep you on the path. If you start lying to yourself, you are very likely to leave the path. And this is when being able to know from one thing, 10,000 things becomes so essential because the dogmatic mind does the exact opposite. The dogmatic mind takes one thing and it makes it its, its core, its core identity. So it will take 10,000 things. It will take all of the knowledge of the universe it will then pour it into that one thing and say, this one thing is all of the truth in the universe. And that, of course, cannot be true. You cannot reduce 10,000 things into one thing, but you can do the opposite. From one thing, you can know 10,000 things. You can expand your knowledge. And that is the way. That this, this quotation is the way because walking on the way, you will start knowing one thing. 
But before you know it, you will know 10,000 things. It's a spirit. It's the application of the spirit that, as Musashi says, you cannot explain, right? I can repeat myself as much as I want. The more I'm going to try and make it clear, the more complex it's going to sound. The only thing I can tell you is that you must practice this mindset on a daily basis. From one thing, no 10,000 things. From the smallest thing, try to make it broader. Try to apply it to everything else. Then and only then is theory worth it because it's theory that develops itself through practice. And when you do that, you'll also manage to accomplish something that Musashi says is very important, which is to realize that small things and big things are really one and the same. The only difference is the scope. The only difference is the perspective. A small thing is only small because you're close to it, right? If I look at this branch, right, there's a branch behind me. If I get the branch closer to me like this, Right? What started as far away and small is now extremely big. And now I see all of the details. Is the branch that is in my hand right now small or big? Well, technically, you could tell me that, yes, it is small because its dimensions are small. But I'm a human. If I get closer to them, the dimensions get bigger. And now I just broke the branch. So I'm going to get cursed or something. But that is the point. This ability to scope in and out. This is how you're going to be able to take in everything at once. And this is also how you stay on the way. If you're constantly scoping in on the way, you're going to miss so many things around you so that in reality, your, your journey on the way is not going to be that interesting. You're not going to learn much. But if you are also always scoped out and you always see things in the broader term, you're never going to see all of the small details on the way. So you have to, you have to have the ability to have both. You have to have the ability to scope in and out at will. And that way, you will be able to encompass everything. You're going to be able to broaden your perspective. And once your perspective is broad enough, then everything you do will be of use. Another great teaching by Musashi. He says, never do something that is not of use. If you look at this statement, you could say, well, that is dogmatic because it means that I'm only supposed to do things that are going to, in a sense, align with the way. Yes, but the way is everything. So once you see that the way is everything and that you can find the way in everything, then everything that you do will have use. But if you never manage to broaden your perspective and the way only remains narrow, then the majority of the things you're going to do are not going to be of use, which is when Musashi tells you, hey, only do things which are of use, meaning broaden your perspective, renounce your dogmatism, and from one thing, know 10,000 things. If you read the book times and times again, Musashi tells you, hey, practice, practice, practice. You must research this constantly. This is what I do with this book. Every year, I read at least one or two times every summer. I take it to the forest and I read the book. Why? Because there is something to learn. Every single time, there is something to learn. The book sounds cryptic sometimes, but I guarantee you that if you give it a shot, like you would give the way, because the book is really a metaphor for the way, the more you train and the more you approach the way, the more you try to understand it, the bigger it opens and the more of its wealth of wisdom you are going to receive. So absolutely approach it with that spirit and I guarantee you that you are going to greatly benefit from it. Remember that the way is in training. That he also tells you times and times again. This from a man who trained on a daily basis way into his 60s. The way is in training. If you do not train, you are not walking the way. I do not care what you're doing. You are not walking the way because how can you walk the way if you are not walking? Physical activity is everything. Shipmunks make so much noise. They sound so much bigger than they actually are. And also remember this, and I'm going to leave you with that. Even if a man has no natural ability, he can be a warrior by sticking assiduously to the way. There is hope for everyone. Everyone can be a warrior as long as you follow all of the advices that Musashi outlines here. Advices that, mind you, are not even 5% of this book. All of the things that I just read you are contained within the first 15 pages. So if this does not make you to spend five bucks to buy this and then read it until it's beat up like this, then I don't know what will. But that was that for this small philosophical video. In the woods, I will now leave because the chipmunks are getting agitated and I think that they want me out of their territory. I will be seeing you very soon for another forest video, actually, maybe even a training video. Thank you for watching. Have a good time.